morning and welcome to Holy Spirit. This is the festival of the Transfiguration, the last Sunday in the Epiphany season. The Transfiguration as depicted on the stained glass above the altar. We begin with the opening acclamation. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be our kingdoms, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. And peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God, and Father, we worship you because you are holy. Amen. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Our first reading this morning is a reading from the book of Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off, until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the, faces, the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on again until he went in to speak with him. The word of the Lord. Our response this morning to the first reading is Psalm 99. Please pray it with me. The Lord is king. Let the people tremble. He is enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all peoples. Let them confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One. Almighty King, 
lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One, Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. O Lord, our God, you answered them indeed. You were a God who forgave them, yet punished them for their evil deeds. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is the Holy One. A reading from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness, not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened, indeed to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant that same veil is still there, since only Christ is, is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, when Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord, as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Lord, Jesus, Christ. Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. <coughs> Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. <coughs> And all were astounded at the greatness of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In our Gospel reading two Sundays ago, you and I were with Jesus as he spoke to his disciples and to the crowds, all gathered on a level place, somewhere on a fertile plain in rural Galilee. Today, however, our gospel takes us away from that level place, up to the top of a nearby mountain. As Luke's narrative has been unfolding these past weeks, Jesus has been busy preaching, teaching, healing. He's been so busy that he now must be at the point of exhaustion. Today then, as our reading begins, we're told that he, along with three of his disciples, withdrew from the crowds and sought out a mountaintop where he might find rest and a quiet time to pray. Mountains in the ancient world, and even today, are often seen as places for contemplation, for spiritual renewal and refreshment. Living as we do in western Montana, in and amongst the peaks of the Bitterroot Range, the Mission Range, and Glacier National Park, 
we're well aware of that. But what was intended to be a quiet time for Jesus and those three disciples became, as Luke tells it, something quite different. For we're told that Jesus' appearance strikingly is transformed. And then all of a sudden, two revered figures from Israel's past, Moses and Elijah, returned from the heavens to stand with Jesus and to speak with him. So Moses and Elijah are there to speak with Jesus. It was hardly a quiet, relaxing, peaceful respite from all the crowds. Rather, it becomes a moment of religious revelation, a dramatic epiphany, which will lead Luke's audience, we included, to a new level of understanding of who Jesus is and what he is about. So what are we to make of this story? What is Luke's intention in situating this account near the halfway point in his gospel? I'd suggest that he places it here in that it marks a turning point in Luke's story of Jesus. It looks back on the one hand, drawing upon stories from the past, and then it points ahead, anticipating what lies yet before us in the gospel narrative. In describing that moment of revelation, that epiphany, Luke first takes us back to remind us of stories we've heard already told in Luke as well as of stories we know from Israel of old. So as Jesus begins to pray atop the mountain, Luke describes that the complexion of Jesus' face changes dramatically. Like Moses in today's first lesson, whose face glowed with divine light because he had been face to face with God. Now the same with Jesus. So here Luke builds upon that story from Exodus 34, read for us moments ago. The story of Moses in the presence of God receiving again the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And in so doing, Luke suggests that Moses, as Moses was once the mediator of God's covenant with Israel, Jesus now will soon mediate a new covenant between God and not only Israel, but all nations and peoples. As Luke draws parallels between Moses on Mount Sinai and Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, so too Paul, in our second lesson, will utilize that same text, Exodus 34, as the lead in to words he has for the Corinthian congregation. There Paul allegorically likens the veil Moses used to shield the Israelites from the blinding glow of his face. He likens it to another veil, the veil that prevented some of his fellow Jews from understanding what was truly at the heart of the covenant God had made with them. For in Paul's mind, many in the Corinthian church had become so focused on trivial or minor matters of religious law, such as dietary regulations or Sabbath observance or circumcision, that they missed, that they overlooked what was really at the heart 
of God's commandments, the fundamental call to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. They had become obscure. Also, Luke in today's gospel, when he has Moses the lawgiver appear alongside Jesus, he adds that the prophet Elijah joined the conversation. Elijah, the prophet for whom Mount Sinai had also been a place of revelation, as it had been for Moses. Elijah, who according to tradition, had not died as mortals do, but who had been swept up into heaven, such that many had come to believe that he would miraculously return someday from the heavens to inaugurate a new era of peace and reconciliation. Here then, Luke says the same about Jesus. What was expected of Elijah in days to come is already present now in the one from Nazareth. And Luke's recollection of these stories from the past culminates, culminates in his allusion, allusion to the account of Jesus' baptism which we heard read early last month. Then you may recall after his baptism by John, as the spirit descends on Jesus in the form of a dove, a heavenly voice speaks the words, you, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So too now, on the Mount of Transfiguration. There is a voice from the thick cloud, the very same voice heard at Jesus' baptism, saying, this, this is my son, the chosen. Listen to him. So looking to the past and weaving all of these themes together, Luke's answer to the question of Jesus' identity is that he, he, Jesus, is the one for whom Israel has waited all these many years. But from looking back, Luke moves on this morning to look ahead. He then secondly anticipates what is yet to unfold in the rest of his narrative. He points to Lent and to Easter. He anticipates Jesus' passion, death, resurrection. There on the Mount of Transfiguration, as Moses and Elijah speak to Jesus of his departure, Luke uses for departure the same Greek word, the Greek word exodus the same word his audience would have known well from their reading of the Old Testament in its Greek translation. Exodus, referring both to the book and to that great event which brought freedom to Israel. But now Jesus' exodus, he says, through which will come our freedom from sin and death, is soon to be accomplished as Jesus begins to make his way, take his exodus to Jerusalem and to the cross. Also, Luke here hints at that evening soon to come, when after sharing supper with the 12 disciples, Jesus will go off to pray on another mountain, this time the Mount of Olives, but while he is at prayer, you recall that the disciples who were with him fell asleep. Luke then sees their slumber on the night of his arrest and trial, foreshadowed, foreshadowed today as we hear that Peter 
James and John were weighed down with sleep while Jesus was with Moses and Elijah on the mountain. Finally, in Luke's description today of the dramatic change in Jesus' appearance, there in the presence of Moses and Elijah, we're told that his clothes became dazzling, dazzling white. I think it's no coincidence that the very same Greek word for dazzling will show up a second time in Luke's Gospel, now in his account of Easter morning. The story when the women go to the empty tomb, they find two men in dazzling white apparel who asks them, why do you seek the living? among the dead. So there, on the Mount of Transfiguration, barely at the midpoint of Luke's Gospel, not only is Jesus' death foreshadowed, but his resurrection as well. By looking back, and then ahead, Luke seeks to answer the question which has been repeatedly asked by the crowds. The crowds who came to hear Jesus preach, by those who witnessed his acts of healing, the question that was asked by King Herod and asked even by Peter, who is this? Who is this man? Today, in the ninth chapter of Luke's Gospel, he gives us his answer. For as Jesus preaches, as he teaches, as he heals the sick, as he sets out on his journey to the cross, Jesus shows himself to be God's beloved Son, the Messiah of Israel, the one chosen by God, who calls us each to take up our cross and follow him in lives of obedience and service to all those who hunger and thirst, hunger and thirst both in body and in spirit. Today's gospel ends then, not there on the mountaintop with Jesus arrayed in dazzling white, but it ends with Jesus and his disciples emerging from the cloud to go back down into the hustle and bustle of everyday Galilee, to go back into the crowds, touching the lives of the vulnerable and the needy, the hungry and the homeless, touching the lives of refugees seeking a place of security, those families who even today flee across the border with Poland from a senseless war in the Ukraine. And yes, even those who at our own southern border seek to cross the Rio Grande in search of a better life for themselves, for their children and their grandchildren. So today's gospel ends not atop the Mount of Transfiguration, but it ends with the account of the epileptic boy brought to Jesus by his father. Jesus rebukes the unclean spirit, heals the boy, returns him healthy and whole to his parents, and all, all, we included, were and continue to be astounded, astounded at the greatness of God. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Amen.
Let us stand and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, the God from not made, of one being with the Father. Prayers of the people are guided by Form 6 found on page 392 of the Book of Common Prayer and in the service leaflet. Please pray them with me. In joyful, vocal strains, we raise a voice of prayer, a hymn of praise. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. We raise a voice for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. We raise a voice for this community, the nation, and the world. For all who are justice, freedom, and peace. We raise a voice for the just and the proper use of your creation. We raise a voice for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. We raise a voice for the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. We pray for Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, for Marty Stebbins, our bishop, for our priests deacons, and lay leaders of the Holy Spirit and across the diocese, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God and Christ the Church. We pray for all who are on, our, are on our hearts, for our sick, and for those who cannot be with us. Today we pray especially for Jerry, Sawyer, Hannah Abbott, Maggie Teague, Phil Beckmeyer, Mackie, Holly Houston, Delena and Sean, Olivia Chamberlain and family, Frank, Anthony, and Benjamin Horton, Joel, Beth Franz, Jean Clark, Terry Ann Grotzinger, Betsy Doty, Chris, Claire, and Brendan Shields and the O'Keefe family, Sandy, Alexander, Don Russell, Ed Wells, Jody Ulrich, Helen, Jeannie, Graham, 
Bert Horton, Linda Rauner Manfredi, Tom, Donnie, Ira. We also pray for those who put their lives on the line for our community, for your will and a way forward to be revealed for the borderline tension in Ukraine, for those whose voices may not be heard, and for our neighbors who are sick, in prison, oppressed, addicted, suicidal, fearful, or without enough food, shelter, or sense of community. <coughs> for those preparing to listen at the borderlands, we give thanks for our partnership with the Rio Grande Borderland Ministries of the Episcopal Diocese of the Rio Grande, and pray for the community of RGMBM in our shared mission to ensure that our migrant neighbors are embraced in the service of justice, the interests of dignity, and the spirit of love. And in silence or aloud for other people or oppressions, we lift to you now. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We raise a hymn of praise and thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name for forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. We pray especially this morning for Lance Jones, Jacob Chasse, Brad Jacobson, and Bill Holt, for those lost to disease or violence, and in silence or aloud for other loved ones who have gone before us. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put the trust in you. In joyful, hopeful strain, we raise a voice of prayer, a hymn. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will and those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. The Battle of the Mics. Can you hear this one? Let's see. Green lights on. Let's see. I'll, um, I'll project. Um, thank you, Tom, for 
wading through the water um, this morning with us and taking us to the mountain. We appreciate you being here, as always. I'm wondering if there are any visitors here who would like to introduce themselves before we jump into announcements. Good, we'll know you all are welcome. Um, a few announcements for us. Uh, we expect Terry to migrate back to the office this week and, um, and rejoin our community. So next Sunday, she will be with us along with Anita Ragnus here who will be preaching and serving as deacon. So thank you, Anita, for jumping into that service. Uh, after our worship today, there will be a special offering in the parish hall. You'll see it there in the announcements, Holy Family, Human Family, a uh, narrated story with some beautiful um, pictures as well. And we ask that you come and partake of that gift, uh, a story written by our own Clem Worth uh, and shared by several narrators here in the parish. Um, also, let's see what's next up this week, Ash Wednesday. We will gather here on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. for Eucharist and the Imposition of Ashes. So please join us if you can as we begin our Lenten journey. Also, the night before, Social Concerns is back to meeting in person and in the parish hall, well, actually, Guild Room. Um, so if you'd like to come and join Social Concerns, if you haven't been a part of us before, we gather at 5.30, and there's usually some enticing treats. Um, let's see, then we've got our pilgrimage to the borderlands. We're gonna have a special prayer and an announcement here, but you can see that our first group goes early this next Sunday. So thank you for holding those people and their work and listening in your prayers. Um, we also will begin on March the 9th. Uh, Valerie Hess is leading us in um, Watch and Pray uh, using the book Prayer in the Night. So we will have five sessions via Zoom that begin at seven o'clock on that um, starting Wednesday the 9th. And if you haven't registered yet at the office, please do so um, by this next Sunday. So we know to prepare for you for welcoming. Um, sorry, let me flip here. Um, next Sunday is also Episcopal Relief and Development Sunday. I know many of you are familiar with the work of ERD. We will learn more and there will be a special offering for ERD that day. And then Tom's class wrapped up, and um, I think that you had almost as many watching online as you did, or on the recording, as you did in person. So the recordings are there and available to you if you would like to partake um, during the Lenten season. And then I want to um, offer a shout out for the registrations for Camp Marshall summer camps. Uh, there's some special scholarships available this year. And we just ask that you contact the church office and explore that offering. There is something for all ages, families, and, um, and kids throughout, including a special grace camp for children who have um, one or both parents incarcerated. So, um, so please pray about Camp Marshall and pray about that camp opportunity. And I think I will leave the rest for you outside of birthdays and anniversaries. Do we have any, any special opportunities to celebrate? We'll need our All right, Catherine. Right. Happy birthday. Thank you. We're going to pray uh, prayer 50 on page 830 if you would join us in a prayer for Catherine. O oh God, our times are in your hands. Look with favor, we pray, on your servant, Catherine, as she begins another year. Grant that she may grow in wisdom and grace, and strengthen her trust in your goodness all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Happy 
All right, I think we're ready for our special prayer for our pilgrims. If any of our first group of pilgrims are here and could come forward, Tom will offer a special blessing for the group. And Liesl, if you can hold your mom's spirit in prayer here too, I know she's serving in Hamilton today, so. Let us pray. O God, whose glory fills the whole creation and whose presence we find wherever we go, preserve those who travel. For those of this congregation traveling to the border along the Rio Grande, there to learn, to discern, and to interpret for us the needs of those migrants seeking a new life in this land. Surround them with your loving care, protect them from every danger, and bring them in safety to their journey's end through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Okay, as Dorsey mentioned, a couple of very brief announcements. First, I want to thank the several parishioners who spontaneously have made donations to the Rio Grande Borderland Ministry. Their donations are very, very much appreciated and will help the people in New Mexico and Texas get migrants from there to their sponsors elsewhere in the United States. Second, I want to mention a way that all of us can participate which should be very easy, especially as we're coming up to spring cleaning. Any clothing you have that you're not going to use and you might take to goodwill, any children's books that your children have outgrown, children's shoes, socks, all of that is needed by the people who arrived at the border with almost nothing. And we have a group, especially not in our group, but the group that's leaving at the end of March, there are several people who are traveling by car and have offered to take those things down to the border if we can get them collected here in the parish hall. So anything like that you've got, it would be very much appreciated by us, by people at the Diocese of Rio Grande, and most especially by the migrants who need them so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Let us go to the altar of God, there to present the offerings of our life and labor to the Lord.
continue with the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. All thanks and praise are yours at all times and in all places, our true and loving God. Through Jesus Christ, your eternal word, the wisdom from on high by whom you created all things. You laid the foundations of the world and enclosed the sea when it burst out of, from the womb. You brought forth all creatures of the earth and gave breath to humankind. Wondrous are you, Holy One of Blessing. All you create is a sign of hope for our journey. And so, as the morning stars sing your praises, we join the heavenly beings in all creation as we shout with joy. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Glory and honor are yours, creator of all. Your word has never been silent. You called a people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace, you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life, to proclaim the coming of your holy reign and give himself for us a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin, brought us into your life, reconciled us to you, and restored us to the glory you intend for us. We thank you that on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so, remembering all that was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and his ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory, in presenting to you these gifts your earth has formed and human hands have made. We acclaim you, O Christ, dying to destroy our death, rising to restore our life, Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. Grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love. Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ, and in the fullness of time, Gather us with all your people into the joy of our true eternal home. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of, an, of unending praise. 
Blessed are you now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us eat the feast. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Now may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.